Welcome uh, to our second MSAS Grand Challenge presentation. Today's presentation will focus on the topic of stopping family violence. Um, uh, Dr. Barth told me to keep the introduction short because he and Dr. Messing have a lot to talk about. But let me give you a little bit of background on our speakers, uh, and then I'll let them have the, the floor here. Uh, we're honored to have Dr. Richard Barth and Jill Messing as our presenters today. Dr. Barth and, and Messing, Drs. Barth and Messing, are national experts in child maltreatment and intimate partner violence and two of the co-leaders of the Stop Family Violence Grand Challenge Network, which is sponsored by the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare. Dr. Barth is Dean and Professor of School Social Work at the University of Maryland. He previously held chaired professorships at uh, the University of North Carolina and the University of California, Berkeley. He received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees from Brown University and the University of Berkeley, respectively. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare and has served as its president. He has been funded by the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department um, and National Institute of Justice for Studies of Maltreatment, Child Maltreatment, and Intimate Partner Violence. Dr. Barth is especially committed to evidence-based practices to support parents and improve child outcomes. Dr. Jill Messing is, our, is an associate professor at the School of Social Work at Arizona State University. She earned her MSW and PhD in social welfare at the University of California, Berkeley, and went on to complete a postdoctoral fellowship on violence research at John Hopkins University. Her interest areas are intimate partner violence, uh, risk assessment, excuse me, domestic homicide, criminal justice, social service collaborations, and evidence-based practice. She has published more than 40 articles and, and book chapters in her short academic career. Dr. Messing specializes in the development and validation of intimate partner violence risk assessment instruments. She is particularly interested in the use of risk assessment in evidence-based practice and focusing on testing risk-informed interventions for survivor of domestic violence. So without further ado, I, I give you our speakers. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. I'll be speaking first and then Jill will be following. Uh, it's a great honor to be here for um, this lecture and to be at CASE, which has such a historic role in the profession. CASE also has a historic role with regard to the Academy. Um, this is the first home for the Academy. Uh, Claudia Colton was one of the first Academy members, and she uh, asked her dean if, you, if uh, CASE would be willing to be, become the administrative home, which he agreed to do, and if it wasn't for the two of them, um, who knows if there would be an Academy and grand challenges. Um, I'm also very grateful um, to your distinguished faculty for their participation in the Academy. Uh, in addition to uh, Claudia, David Beagle is also a fellow, and Cleve will be inducted as a founding fellow at the upcoming Society for Social Work Research. And I want to thank Betsy Tracy and Jerry Mahoney and Carm uh, for their great um, hosting of us. And I could say much more about the partnerships that we have between Maryland and Case, but I think uh, I should get on to the topic at hand because it's such a vital one. So we call this Observations on the Grand Challenges to Stop Family Violence because um, there, it's a very broad effort and there is, um, uh, we're not going to be conclusive in what we say, but we hope these observations will uh, result in continuing discussion about ways that we can work together across the subfields of family violence to have a greater impact. So briefly, the Academy was established, for those of you who don't know, although I know this is the second Academy lecture, so I won't go on about this a great deal, uh, in 2009. Um, there were six original members, which has now grown to 110, and will still soon be 125, um, intending to offer the nation a, a, a research resource as other national academies have, some of them for as long as since the Civil War when the National Academy of Engineering was developed. The Grand Challenges is the first major initiative of the academy. There are 12 Grand Challenges. Uh, I'm not going to uh, list them for you, 
but they are available on the Grand Challenges initiative part of the Academy website, and we may reference some of them as we go along. Uh, the criteria for Grand Challenges, which the Grand Challenge to Stop Family Violence met, are important, uh, that they, were, they are all big, compelling, and important. They are amenable to analysis, assessment, and improvement. Uh, the expectation is there will be demonstrable progress in a decade, that they involve cross-sector interdisciplinary collaboration, and they also involve significant innovation. If we finish our decade with this grand challenge and we haven't seen innovation in research, education, services, and policy, uh, we will not have thought that this grand challenge was a success. Um, so the background on this particular grand challenge, uh, when we were uh, as a field talking about grand challenges, what would the grand challenges be? Um, at the same time, so all this has its context, and each of the grand challenges, all 12 of them, um, had their own context. Part of the context for family violence was right at that time there was a National Commission to Eliminate Child Abuse and Neglect Fatalities, uh, where they were imagining a society where child safety would be ensured, um, and uh, that would be done through integrating resources, leaders, staff, funds, technology, effective strategies, and flexible approaches to working with families. So I was part, I was not on the commission, but I was part of a number of different conversations related to the commission and testimonies, and that certainly had uh, an influence on me and led me to think about writing with some of my colleagues uh, the working paper, one of the two working papers that anchored this grand challenge, which was on uh, ending severe and fatal maltreatment. Um, so some of the things that are in that working paper, which I'm not going to spend really much other time on today, um, were better systems for reviewing severe and fatal maltreatment, strengthening of birth match and safe haven programs, uh, integrating data systems for monitoring transitional risks, and home visiting programs. So at the same time, uh, so as I was working on that, um, I realized that uh, we needed to have this grand challenge to end family violence better balanced or to extend it out to also talk about intimate partner violence. Um, I was in contact with Jeff Edelson, who I had worked on on the NIJ study uh, that Jerry Mahoney had referenced and who then was on, in the path to becoming dean at, at Berkeley. And we talked about that and he put a team together um, to create a uh, generate a working paper on gender-based violence. Um, that would not have been my first preference, and I expressed that preference. I was really hoping it would be more about family violence because uh, I thought the two would integrate better. But one of the things about the grand challenge is that it is challenging uh, us all to think about different kinds of integration, collaboration, and efforts across um, domains. And the domains we ended up with as working papers were gender-based violence and um, family violence, although much of the discussion we've had amongst the leadership of the network has been related to family violence. Um, so uh, here, um, Jeff and his colleagues um, developed a vision that gender-based violence is a significant enduring social problem um, that would be addressed through this uh, grand challenge. I won't read you more of it. Um, but also recognizing that gender-based violence is linked to many other kinds of violence. And that's a, certainly a key concept uh, of this um, grand challenge. It, it may not seem surprising to you, it may seem so obvious to be silly, um, but that hasn't always been the case. There sometimes have been arguments that some kinds of violence are unique kinds of violence and the people who commit them are not otherwise prone to violence or experience with violence. There's some of that is true, but mostly people who are uh, involved with violence, as I'll describe later, um, are involved with violence in a number of ways. So we wrote these two supporting working papers. The role of the working papers in the Grand Challenge was really just to get them started. They're anchors. Uh, they got some of the authors involved, but they are not definitive of what the spectrum of activities should be related to the Grand Challenge. But one of my convictions out of this um, as one of the early network leads was that um, we really needed to try to figure out how these areas fit together. So in, in very simple terms, we have child maltreatment, um, which involves physical abuse, sexual abuse, of course, emotional abuse and neglect. We have intimate partner violence, um, which involves physical violence and sexual violence, stalking, psychological aggression, 
coercion, of course, by a current or foreign and intimate, and we have gender-based violence, um, which involves physical violence, sexual violence, sexual, psychological violence, sexual trafficking, uh, and sexual harassment, or sexual trafficking, yes. So when we think about how these come together, and this is just really a beginning description, we know that they overlap. Um, we know that um, many families um, are involved certainly with both child maltreatment and intimate partner violence. The National Survey of Child and Adolescent Wellbeing is very clear about that, uh, amongst other sources. Um, and people who commit gender-based violence um, are also likely to be involved, uh, more likely than others to be, I should say, be involved in intimate partner violence and child maltreatment. We think there are a number of different overlaps, certainly, that could be added to this diagram. It's just very preliminary thinking. <clears throat> but it gives you an idea of just how much opportunity there is to explore these uh, intersections. So one of the ways that we are starting to explore this is by thinking about at least four different issues. Uh, and I'm going to take you through those. One of them is language and terminology. So in the child maltreatment world, we talk about, we sometimes talk about victims. So NCANs gives us a number of victims every year for child abuse and neglect. Although I will say there's been discussion for decades now about whether we should really call them victims. So if someone fails to supervise you uh, and that's the reason that you're neglected, are you really a victim? It's not the best language, um, I think, but it is sometimes used or we talk about abused or neglected children. We talked about neglecting or in the courts inadequate parents. We talk a lot about family conflict. Recently, we've been talking about families with high adverse childhood experiences, basically families that have all kinds of things going on in them. Um, in intimate partner violence, we tend to talk about survivors and perpetrators. So we bring in the concept of perpetrators and survivors, which is different from the child maltreatment language, although sometimes we just certainly do talk about survivors of sexual abuse. Uh, and the VA now, they're talking about those who use violence and those who experience violence. Um, rather than survivors and perpetrators, but I think that's still fairly new language that hasn't really been broadly um, adopted. In gender-based violence, we use different language. We use the language more like IPV, uh, survivors, perpetrators, and we also talk about bystanders. So the point here is that we have this, um, experience, this world of violence that um, social work has been involved with since its inception, even before its inception. One of the reasons why social work began, at least according to Linda Gordon, would be uh, because of family violence uh, combined with substance abuse that was going on even in the 1880s and it was recorded in those days. Um, so we have this, we had a time, and Jane Addams also, where these areas were sort of integrated and they have been pulled apart. We have allowed ourselves, I would say, uh, to allow them to be these areas to be pulled apart. Uh, there's always some advantage in that, um, certainly, but I think um, from my perspective at least, uh, the impetus right now is to try to figure out how we can bring some of that back together and um, learn from these two or three uh, really respective fields. The research methods are somewhat different. Um, child maltreatment research has a rich history of longitudinal surveys now. Long scan uh, has uh, participants now into their late 20s. Um, NSCA is going into its third uh, reiteration. They're not, they've only followed families for six years, but uh, at the longest, but that's one. Child welfare uses a lot of administrative records, and much of that work was really um, led by Claudia and her colleagues um, over the years. And, um, but it's a very important source of information about child welfare, which as I understand it is little available uh, in the IPV world. Um, and there's a growing number of randomized clinical trials, um, including the one that you're doing here with the Arnold Foundation um, and uh, re-entry into foster care and quasi-experimental designs. The intimate partner violence, gender-based violence world um, has some very important cross-sectional surveys uh, that have been done. Um, criminal justice records are often used. Uh, CBPR is a method, um, the community-based participatory research is a method that's used, and there's a growing number of quasi-experimental designs. Um, but I think, uh, from my perspective at least, the, uh, the opportunity to connect these two very important fields is very much um, under-realized. 
So causal factors. Um, all of these things are changing to a certain extent, but I certainly have more than once heard from people who say um, that for the most part, these risk factors that we think of in child maltreatment, like poverty, housing instability, substance abuse, exposure to trauma, and harsh parental history are not the important factors in intimate partner violence, that this cuts across the board um, and is really uh, at all sectors of society uh, as it is um, in, uh, in incidents, but not necessarily in terms of risk, and that instead, it is fundamentally a result of intersectional structural oppressions and social norms that blame victims and fail to hold offenders accountable. Includes ecological factors, um, particularly those that are a result of sexism. So I don't want to make too stark a contrast here, but I think there has been a very different emphasis in these two um, areas of family violence understanding with regard to how much um, these risk and protective factors are contributing versus a uh, sort of more general um, patriarchal perspective related to oppression that cuts across the board. Uh, so the last comparison I'm going to make is on uh, tertiary interventions. What do we do when we know that um, child maltreatment has occurred or intimate partner violence has occurred? Um, my point here is really that in child maltreatment, it's still very family focused. The basic presumption is uh, we want to keep the family together. We want to reunify the family if it's apart. Um, we want to use uh, family therapy and conflict resolution methods uh, and maybe get extended family involved as much as possible. Um, there are also now some media campaigns, which I think is also common with uh, intimate partner violence. On the GBVs, on the gender-based violence side, the changes tend to be more about separation than unification, so separating offenders, uh, and that is done in a lot of different ways uh, through legislative changes, through criminal and civil uh, justice system remedies, for through offender treatment programs, which actually provide some promise of reunification if you can complete them successfully, um, through advocacy and through shelter and housing. But the spectrum of services looks very different in terms of family involvement um, between these two areas, and there's certainly some reasons behind that. I'm not saying that any of these decisions have not been thoughtfully made. I'm just saying that the point we've gotten to at this point in time is that we have one system that's about family involvement and unification, and we have one system that's about um, separation uh, much more, with little attention, for the most part, to, to family involvement. Oh, I did have one more. Outcomes. Um, for child maltreatment, it's safety and permanency. For intimate partner violence, it's um, identifying lethality, uh, stopping the violence, fixing the relationship to a certain extent, separation and accountability. Uh, and for gender-based violence, um, safety for survivors, accountability again, um, and uh, a bit more of an emphasis on survivor-centered and trauma-informed outcomes, but that's a fairly new uh, area of, of work. So I think I've probably foreshadowed this by now, but um, one of the emerging grand challenge questions, and it isn't the only question, and um, it need not ever be the only question, uh, is in what way can we better integrate these social work traditions to create an array of responses that connect the dots towards healthy, violent-free relationships and communities? So I think this is something we agree on. Um, wholeheartedly across this spectrum of family violence um, initiatives, programs, research, domains, however we want to call them. Um, and, and that's one of the things we've been writing about. So uh, Rebecca Macy and I, with uh, considerable input uh, from uh, Jill and, um, and other members of the Intimate Partner Violence and Child Maltreatment Community, have put together a chapter for a forthcoming book on the Grand Challenges that tries to explore this question, and I think we will continue uh, to uh, try to explore this question. Um, borrowing a quote from Deborah Prothrow Stith, um, who's writing about gang violence, which of course is uh, on many people's minds. It could also be community violence. Um, she says it's connected to bullying, connected to school violence, connected to partner violence, connected to child abuse, and connected to elder abuse. It's all connected. Uh, the CDC has also uh, 
uh, taken on that um, approach, and they have um, uh, now several um, reports and now a whole new social media uh, program related to connecting the dots, showing that these kinds of violence overlap uh, in time, uh, that they're, but that, um, but also pulling together the science that describes ways that you can predict from one phase of life and one time of, of violence. For example, child maltreatment um, in the early years of life um, that may then predict to teen dating violence, which may then predict to and, and does predict to a certain extent to intimate partner violence. So um, I just want to say a bit about shared risk and protective factors. And of course, these are factors. They're not determinants. Um, and, um, and this work is continuously evolving. But I think it's pretty clearly pointing us in an important direction that um, says that connecting the dots is very uh, important. And I know that this is something that you have worked on here in case in your um, renowned Begun Center uh, on violence. But um, so I have some tables that I'm going to flash through very quickly um, that kind of try to just give you a gestalt of just what the overlap, what the studies are. I'm not going to try to take you through all those. I'll mention a few. Um, but what we did was we, um, in these tables, just to give you uh, a bit of an orientation, um, we put the kinds of violence across the top, child maltreatment, teen dating violence, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, youth violence, bullying, suicide, and elder abuse. And then down the side, some of the risk factors um, at the societal level. So there are studies basically uh, that are behind all of those X's, sometimes many studies, sometimes one. I can't say it's a deeply developed argument, but it is, um, it's definitely there. There's definitely a pattern. Um, if you look at neighborhood risk factors, you also see a very similar pattern. We don't have a lot of data on teen dating violence, frankly. Otherwise, that column might also um, look different or bullying. Those are fairly new phenomena to study, and I was very pleased to hear uh, from some of your PhD students that those studies are, are on the way. Um, at, uh, we shouldn't ignore protective factors, and there are uh, interventions which seem to um, uh, hold promise in, uh, an, for a number of different kinds of violence reduction. Um, and, uh, and, and that's important to recognize. The intervention data, though, in these areas is still fairly modest. And I think that's really striking to me, because although CASE has done a lot in violence prevention, as someone who lives in Baltimore, which has lots of violence, um, I get calls all the time from uh, the newspaper, from uh, colleagues in government and the health department, from foundations, from uh, anybody who wants to know what is the School of Social Work doing here? What, what are your interventions? And we have some general ecological interventions, promised neighborhoods and so on, um, school-based interventions, but nothing that really addresses these issues. And it's just a huge opportunity for our field. Um, we know a lot more about relationship risk factors. And those factors definitely overlap. Um, so families that are isolated, uh, that have poor parent-child relationships from early on, family conflict, economic stress, um, peer associations with violent others, and gang and violence, gang violence, you see the impacts across the board. Uh, and the same would be true, and I would spend more time on this if I had more time, um, looking, of course, at individual level protective factors. So I think the point here is that sometimes we say, well, it has to change at the societal level, or it has to change at the community level, or the neighborhood level, or the individual level. All of these offer opportunities for change. And it is probably going to have to, you know, things are going to probably have to have interventions at all of those levels to end up with um, real transformative change. But the relationships are there. Uh, we know that we can address more than one of these problems at a time by addressing any of these problems. Uh, and that's, that's absolutely critical. Um, so uh, this is one that um, probably we talked the most about, which is individual level risk factors, because we are very often working with individuals in terms of our interventions, like battering intervention programs or parent training. Um, and 
I think, again, the point here is that as much as we are working with families and individuals who are multiply involved and mostly at risk, our intervention should also reflect that comprehensive view as much as they can. Um, so just to um, further document this uh, point a bit before um, I ask Jill to come up and give some specific examples of the kind of interventions that um, she and her colleagues are developing, especially around intimate partner violence, that could also be thought of as having broader purposes around the whole spectrum of violence. Um, I want to just take you through some of those connections to make them seem a little more real than just X's on a chart. Um, so we know that girls who are sexually abused are more likely to experience other kinds of violence uh, and sexual revictimization. Uh, Self-harming behavior, suicide, self-harming behavior are sometimes thought of as a kind of violence um, and being a, becoming a victim of intimate partner violence later in life. Um, youth who have been physically abused by a dating partner are likely to have had a history of uh, abuse as a child, been a victim of sexual assault, and witnessed violence in their own families. Uh, and women and girls involved in gangs often have experienced physical, emotional, and sexual abuse by other gang members. Uh, I assume this will be posted up online, and I have at least a partial list of the references in the back of this PowerPoint uh, for those of you who want to explore these studies further. Um, and so it's not just perpetrators, but victims um, uh, who do not necessarily uh, commit violence against others, but um, they may. And we know that children who experience physical abuse and neglect early in their lives are at also greater, list, greater risk for at some point becoming victimizers. Um, and of course, that's one of the things we know from looking at the transition rates between kids involved with child maltreatment and juvenile services. Um, we have a harder time looking at all the kids who don't end up involved first with child maltreatment and then juvenile service and adult corrections because we don't have great prospective data. But when we look backwards, we see high levels of overlap. And then um, this is certainly the case that people who behave violently are more likely to commit other forms of violence. Um, we know that adults who are violent towards their partner are at higher risk of being violent towards their children. Uh, and youth that who bully others in their peer group are more likely to commit a whole range of kinds of violence. And there's a growing body of evidence that is being embraced by social workers um, related to spanking. So I haven't seen nearly this level of conversation and research about spanking as uh, both research in, the, in uh, Canada and the US that's really showing that spanking may disinhibit parents in ways that makes them feel like it's OK to hit their children uh, in ways that later on uh, result in even severe and fatal um, maltreatment. So um, that evidence is, is growing. Um, so we think if we could connect the dots, um, as CDC is suggesting, uh, and as Deborah uh, prothrow Stith is suggesting, um, and as could become a core element of this grand challenge, that we could prevent multiple forms of violence simultaneously. We could develop new partnerships uh, between child maltreatment and partner violence providers and other community providers that have often been at odds. We could better leverage resources and funding streams. We could consider a larger pool of strategies that um, more accurately may uh, identify risk, which I think the folks in the intimate partner violence world are getting very good at. Um, we don't have those kinds of tools in the same way for child maltreatment. We also might develop more family-based strategies, which I think the folks in the child maltreatment world may be ahead on. Um, and we may offer families help that actually feels like help. One of the biggest concerns we have in child maltreatment and also um, in the intimate partner violence world, especially led by Lee uh, Goodmark's work, is that the help that we give often doesn't feel like help to the people who are getting it. And I, we think, uh, I think we could have a greater chance of doing that if we combine forces. Um, so I'm going to skip over those. And um, we'll have some time for questions and ask um, Jill to come up and take us on through. Thank you. Great, thank you, hi. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit more about um, specific interventions um, that focus 
more on my area of intimate partner violence, but hopefully we can kind of connect these back um, to how we can kind of be doing these interventions across broader um, broader family issues of family violence. Um, so, so one of the things that I have been kind of talking about and thinking about are these risk-informed collaborative interventions. So um, as Dean Barth was saying, there are so many of these risk and protective factors that cross all of these different forms of violence. Um, and so one of the big questions for my work is what do we what do we do about these risk factors? Um, and so kind of this idea of risk-informed collaborative interventions is how can we take these risk factors, um, identify people who are at very high risk, um, for example, for committing intimate partner homicide, and and, um, and then do interventions that um, that target these high risk groups, but that also when we're when we're thinking about risk, how do we think about turning those risk factors into interventions? So, for example, if we know that unemployment, for example, is a risk factor for intimate partner homicide, how do we can we use that as an opportunity for intervention as well? Um, so, does then getting someone um, into employment services or getting them a a job, will that decrease their risk for committing intimate partner homicide? So how do we think about these risk and protective factors as um, opportunities for intervention? And then the other part of that is how do we um, kind of connect services? So particularly in intimate partner violence, we have these um, pr primarily criminal justice um, interventions. So we're doing criminal justice interventions. And when uh, police go out to a, um, a, a home where intimate partner violence is occurring, there's not always the attendant social services that come along with that. So we're getting better and better at this. Um, but how do we identify where those social services will be helpful? And how do we get those social services as two victims so that we can um, start to kind of uh, break these cycles of violence. So I'm going to talk a bit about kind of what risk assessment is generally, um, and then I'm going to talk about a few uh, risk-informed collaborative interventions um, that I've been working on. So um, when we think about risk, we um, we have um, kind of uh, here you can see when we think about risk assessment, what we're trying to do is predict things that occur in the future. So um, we can have an actual outcome. Generally, I'm looking at actual outcomes of severe or near fatal violence. Um, and when we have this outcome, can we predict that outcome? So you'll see kind of a four quadrant model here where um, about half the time we, we predict the correct outcome. So we could have a risk assessment uh, that is to predict severe or near fatal violence. And we, our risk assessment could say, we think that this person will um, commit severe or near fatal violence and that actually happens. So that would be called a true positive um, or that would be a way that we're right in terms of risk. Um, it, we can also be right in terms of risk by predicting that something's not going to happen, so that severe or near fatal violence is not going to happen and it doesn't happen. So we can, um, there's kind of two ways, two ways that we can be right. We can have true positives and true negatives, but there's also two ways that we can be wrong. Um, so uh, don't tell my husband, but it does happen sometimes. I am wrong sometimes. Um, and so we have uh, false positives and false negatives, right? I could predict that somebody is going to uh, commit severe or near fatal violence and they don't, or I could predict that somebody won't and they will. Um, so when we're, when we're dealing with risk assessment, what we're trying to do is kind of slot people into these four categories in a way that is most effective for that particular risk assessment. And sometimes, um, sometimes that risk assessment uh, well, and I'll, t I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, but depending on uh, what the intervention is, it will depend on whether we want to uh, prioritize sensitivity, right? Our ability to kind of pull in all of the people who may commit an act of violence versus um, prior prioritizing specificity, which is making sure that we're not intervening with those people who aren't going to commit future violence. So I also like to think of risk assessment within kind of an evidence-based practice model. Um, so I think it's really important to, when we, when we recognize and when we think about risk assessment, risk assessment can be um, essentially the best evidence that we have that somebody is going to commit a future act of violence. But of course, human behavior is not always predictable. And it's important that when we kind of, when we, when we have this evidence, 
that we take it into account along with practitioner expertise. So in the risk assessments that I work on, we always want to have some element of practitioner expertise. My risk assessment might say um, that we think someone is not high risk, but we want a practitioner, a police officer, a social worker to be able to say, you know what, I'm looking at this case and although there's not a lot of risk factors here, this person is at high risk. So we always want to be able to allow for that sort of practitioner expertise when we're looking at risk. And then also practitioner expertise comes in when we decide what we're going to do about that risk. So um, we, we, risk assessments don't tell us what to do, right? They tell us what we think might happen, but they don't tell us what to do. So we really still need practitioners to kind of um, help and uh, provide those, those interventions after we, we have these risk assessments. And then client self-determination is an important part of social work practice, and it's an important part of risk assessment as well. So based on what we think somebody is going to do, um, we're not going to force any particular intervention um, on people. We need to allow for some client self-determination as well. So I always kind of like to, to think about this within an evidence-based practice model. So the first risk-informed collaborative intervention that I'm going to talk about is the Lethality Assessment Program. And the Lethality Assessment Program um, was created by the Maryland Network um, to End Domestic Violence. And they um, have a, an 11 item risk assessment. So this is based on a version of the danger assessment. They have an 11 item risk assessment um, that was developed to, um, to enhance sensitivity. So if somebody answers yes to any of the first three questions they're screened in, or if somebody answers yes to any three of the following eight questions, they're also screened in. And this particular risk assessment, so when we look at, um, when we look at samples of, um, of, of people who have kind of filled out this risk assessment and what happens uh, with their violence seven months, approximately seven months later, you can see that we do a very good job of pulling in the people who, so kind of this top white, right quadrant, or left, sorry, left, yes. Um, we do a very good job of pulling in the people who are going to commit severe or near fatal violence. But that does come at a cost. So we're also pulling into this risk assessment, into this intervention. We're saying that a lot of people are at high risk when they don't commit violence in these following seven months. And so this risk assessment, this particular risk assessment, really prioritizes that sensitivity. So um, can we make sure to capture, and here, in this particular sample, we capture all but two of the people who commit violence on follow-up. Um, so we have about 98% sensitivity in this risk assessment, but our specificity on the other side of that is only at about 20%. So we're pulling in, while we're pulling in so many of the people who are going to commit violence on follow-up, we're also pulling in a bunch of people who are not. Well, for this particular intervention, um, that's not, it's, it's not that bad because if we think about what we're doing with this risk assessment, right? So this next step is really important because what we're doing with this risk assessment is that if someone is at high risk, we ask the police officer, so right, somebody, a police officer has gone out for a call for service. Um, they've conducted this risk assessment. If they determine that the survivor is at very high risk, they'll put her on a telephone call with an advocate or they ask her if she would like to be on a phone call with an advocate to do some immediate safety planning, to encourage her to come in for services. Um, and so, so this is not a very high, high stakes intervention, right? The, the person can uh, say no, they don't want to talk on the phone. They can talk on the phone and take no additional action. Um, or they can, right, talk on the phone and access services. But this high sensitivity ensures that we capture all of the people who are at high risk. And yes, some people who are not at very high risk will also speak to an advocate on the phone, um, but that's not, right, that's okay. Everyone could speak to an advocate, right? Um, so, uh, so in any case, we um, so in this particular intervention, we did a quasi-experimental research study to look at uh, what um, the, the outcomes essentially of this intervention. And the way that we did that was that we had um, police uh, police um, had calls for service and. 
at first, so this was, um, so before we implemented the intervention, we had the police um, do their intervention as usual. So do whatever they would normally do. They, um, you know, made an arrest, didn't make an arrest. In the state where we were doing the study, it actually is not a mandatory arrest state. So police just kind of did, they did their thing. And then um, we asked them to refer victims to us to do telephone interviews um, at, uh, as, as soon as possible after the intervention. And then about seven months later, we called the victims again and we spoke to them and asked them about um, their experiences of violence since we spoke to them last. And we asked them about um, the help seeking that they had done since we spoke to them last. And then um, once we got enough people in this comparison group, we implemented the lethality assessment intervention. So we um, had police go out still, they do their intervention as usual, they use the risk assessment, and then if someone's at high risk, they put that person in uh, contact with an advocate if that person chose to do so. Um, and then we did the same thing. We called the victim as soon as possible after the incident, and we called her again about seven months later, and we asked her about her experiences of violence and help seeking kind of in the, the intermediate time. So um, we also were able to control for violence, the violence that people had experienced prior to to um, their intervention by police. We looked at a longer version of a risk assessment, the danger assessment, and then we looked at protective actions that they took. And what we found um, is that after about seven months, we did see reductions in violence. Um, among people who had participated in the intervention. So um, if we, and kind of no matter how we uh, looked at it, I did several different um, analyses. I was, I was joking earlier that I had to learn to do propensity score analysis for uh, particular reviewers who, um, when I tried to publish this paper, everybody said, do propensity score analysis. And it actually reduced, when I did the propensity score analysis, there were no significant differences between that and the original logistic regression that I had done. But um, it does, it actually makes our our numbers look a little bit better. Um, so so that, was, that was nice of them, I guess. Um, but I still present both because I want people to know that I, you know, that my original analysis was okay too. Um, so we did a logistic regression and propensity score analysis and found that people who participated in the intervention, so that is, were screened in as high risk and actually spoke to the um, spoke to the advocate on the telephone, um, whether or not they did anything after that. So all they had to do was speak to that advocate on the telephone. And about seven months later, we see that they had um, about 14, somewhere between 14 and 16 points less violence. And this is a severity by frequency weighted score. Um, so we can kind of, um, you know, that could be, it could be many forms of violence, but as an example, that would be um, as if over the next seven months they were uh, beat up two less times, punched an additional two less times, and strangled less one more time. Um, strangled less. Uh, so it's you know it's um, it's a it's a significant difference between the groups. Um, and then when we look at an intent to treat analysis, so uh, if someone was intended to um, intended to receive the intervention, so this is a group that screened in as high risk. Um, some of them spoke to the advocate and some of them did not. We did not see significant differences. Although the intervention group had less violence, we did not see significant differences in violence um, when we look at the intent to treat analysis. And then the other thing we were really interested in looking at was, um, okay, did these, did these people who spoke to the advocate on the telephone, did they uh, engage in more help-seeking behaviors? So across the top are all of the help-seeking behaviors that the intervention group engaged in more. So they were more likely to remove a weapon um, from their partner's house immediately after the incident. They were more likely to seek services for domestic violence if they were in the intervention group. They were more likely to establish a code with family and friends. They were more likely to obtain some form of protection, um, which uh, you know we, we're not entirely sure what that means, but it could mean that they got some sort of weapon, which um, is not necessarily protective. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, they were more likely to apply for an order of protection. They were more likely to obtain an order of protection. They were more likely to seek medical care for injuries. 
they were more likely to go somewhere that their partner could not find them, and their partner was more likely to go somewhere that he could not access them, which primarily was jail. Um, and so, uh, so, we, so we see in these groups that uh, the women who participated in the intervention are experiencing less violence, they're doing more help seeking. Um, and so kind of our next question was like, okay, well, that's nice, um, but is this help seeking actually leading to less violence? So the next thing we did was we looked within the intervention group and we said, okay, and so if, if somebody uh, goes somewhere that their partner cannot find them, does that person actually experience less violence? Um, so are these protective actions associated within the intervention group with experiences less, experiencing less violence? Um, and so with, for all the ones with the little stars, um, those are the ones where uh, the, within the intervention group, people who did these protective actions, so those that sought services, those that established a code with family and friends, those that applied for a protection, protection order, whether or not they received it, those who sought medical care, those who went somewhere there, and those who went somewhere their partner could not find them, actually experienced less violence on follow-up. Um, so these, these actions um, may be related to uh, those experiences of less violence on follow-up. And so, and I've I've looked at this actually in some other um, in some other articles as well, and other papers, as how much are women's protective actions associated with decreases in violence? And what we find is that some protective actions are so um, going to shelter can significantly reduce um, risk of reassault, obtaining a protection order, um, arrest. In some in some research does reduce assaults, and some research it does not. Um, but I think one of the things that I really kind of started thinking about with regards to this is what, what we see in these analyses is if we look at past violence um, and we look at future violence, we're seeing that violence predicts violence. So no matter what protective orders are going on, um, particularly severe and moderate forms of violence predict severe and moderate forms of violence at follow-up. So um, it started uh, getting me thinking in particular about who is the target of this intervention, right? In, in my own work, often what I'm doing is looking at uh, survivor protective actions. Um, so what are women doing to avoid violence by their partners? Um, but that doesn't necessarily always help them to avoid violence. Um, and in fact, uh, perhaps we're not looking at the, um, the right, um, the, the right uh, intervention. So I want to talk for a minute about um, the, the domestic violence high-risk teams, of which you guys are doing um, one here in Cleveland and two police jurisdictions. I know that the Begun Center is um, helping with the evaluation of that, and I've talked to a couple of people about that since I've gotten here, which is very exciting. Um, and so I, I worked, well, let me tell you a little bit about what domestic violence high-risk teams are. So domestic violence high-risk teams do a very similar, um, a very similar intervention to the lethality assessment program, except for that the target of their intervention is more about the system. So they use a risk assessment. This one um, is called the DALE. I'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute to determine who's at very high risk for homicide, which victims are at very high risk. And then they do case conferences. So they pull together people from all different parts of the system. They pull together uh, law enforcement. Uh, so, and social services, sometimes child welfare can be at the table, um, depending on kind of who has an interest in the case. And they bring them together and they talk about what can we do to stop the violence that's occurring in this family. And a lot of what they do in the domestic violence high-risk team model, um, one of their main, so this was created by the Jeannie Geiger Crisis Center. And one of their main kind of uh, points or um, their main focus is ensuring that the survivor can remain in the community um, and that we're kind of removing the perpetrator from that, um, from that space. So I think that uh, goes back to what uh, Dean Barth was talking about earlier, right? So we're, um, we're ensuring that the survivor can re remain in the community, but at the same time, we're often putting a lot more uh, restrictions on the abuser. <clears throat> 
in these cases. And so um, currently, uh, the Office of Violence Against Women is funding an evaluation project of domestic violence high-risk team and um, of the, the lethality assessment intervention. So the DALE is the risk assessment that we created for uh, the Jeannie Geiger Crisis Center for the domestic violence high-risk team. So I worked on this um, quite a bit a little over a year ago um, when Jeannie Geiger was wondering how are we, so, so Jeannie Geiger has done most of their work in smaller communities. And so um, they were uh, getting ready to roll out uh, domestic violence high risk teams here in Cleveland. And they, they came to me and they said, how are we going to figure out who's the, who are the high risk people when we have to look at all of these cases? And so what I did was I used um, some data from Oklahoma to look at um, these uh, all of the risk items on the danger assessment. And we ended up adding two new risk items to, to the deal, um, ones that haven't been used previously. Actually, Maybe I'll talk about that first. Um, one of them is multiple strangulation. So in, in previous research, we have seen that um, attempted strangulation is a risk factor for homicide. And we see when we look at the difference between homicide cases um, or cases where a homicide has occurred and cases where a homicide has not occurred, we see that um, strangulation occurs about seven times, strangulation is about seven times more likely in those homicide cases. But we've started recently looking at uh, multiple uh, incidents of strangulation. And we see that multiple strangulation is associated not only with greater health risks, um, greater injury, but it's also associated with additional risk factors for homicide and more severe violence, um, particularly on follow-up. So um, one of the questions that we added to the DALE is about multiple strangulation. So we have questions on strangulation and questions on multiple strangulation. We also added a question um, about whether their partner had tried to kill them in the past. Um, that has been coming up in, in my research as very predictive of uh, future severe and near fatal violence. So we're looking at, um, so in looking at the DALE, however, um, while the um, while the lethality screen, which is used in the Maryland model, while we really prioritize sensitivity uh, for the lethality screen, that wasn't going to work for somewhere like Cleveland, where they were going to be implementing the deal because. We didn't want to be screening in 70% of cases. That doesn't help um, when we when we're when we're trying to sit down and talk about all of those cases, right? So we don't want to screen in 70% of them. Um, and when we talked about it with Jeannie Geiger, they said, "Okay, we think we think we can handle about 30% of cases. So could we screen in about 30% of the cases um, into into this high risk category? And and at the same time, we prioritize because of the focus." on uh, criminal justice intervention, we also prioritize specificity. So we want to make sure, right, as much as possible, we want to screen in the people who are going to commit violence. But we also want to be very careful to screen out the people who aren't going to commit violence because of kind of the more criminal justice focus. Right now, our stakes are higher. We don't want to be screening in people who um, aren't going to be committing violence, right? This is not um, a brief social service intervention. This is a wraparound case model where we are actually placing more, um, more emphasis on these criminal justice interventions. So you can see here, um, as opposed to the previous, um, the previous uh, kind of uh, chart that I gave you is that our sensitivity here is at about 50%. So we're screening in about 50% of the people who um, who are going to commit violence uh, on follow-up, but our specificity is at about 73%. So we're doing a really good job at screening out the people who aren't going to commit violence. So um, after after the risk assessment is done, the um, right this element of practitioner expertise comes in. So people need to kind of sit down and talk about the cases and decide which are those that that we can really uh, do, a, do a good job of intervening in, and which are those that we think are going to be the most, the most violent kind of on follow-up, and how do we intervene there? Um, so the, um, that, that, uh, that, um, that 
the Office of Violence Against Women project is ongoing, so it'll be really interesting for me to hear. And since I've been here, I've actually um, gotten to see a little bit of the data from the deal. Um, it's my understanding that about 35% of people are being screened in, which is really consistent with our estimate of the 30%. And also that we're seeing some risk factors happen a little bit more and some risk factors happen a little bit less, but actually that the data that I had uh, used to create this instrument is um, kind of playing out in the way that we would expect here in Cleveland. So that's really exciting. Um, I also just want to talk really briefly about how these risk assessments are being used in um, more and more criminal justice areas. So for example, the, um, the Maryland Network Against Domestic Violence, who created the Lethality Assessment Program, is now working to um, create, to use that risk assessment, to use the lethality screen, which remember I said, has this very high sensitivity. Um, but how can we use that lethality screen and add some additional risk factors to increase the specificity and use that, for example, in a court setting. Um, so can we use these risk assessments or use these factors that people are um, asking at the scene of domestic violence incidents, combine those with other uh, criminal justice data um, or other data that's collected by the system and use that to help the criminal justice system make determinations, for example, about pretrial release um, and uh, conditions of pretrial release. So, um, for example, GPS monitoring. Um, so it's, it's uh, really exciting, but also gives us kind of these uh, additional questions about what are we using risk for? So, and um, can we use these sorts of risk assessments to actually implement criminal justice interventions um, or to, for example, to keep someone in jail when we don't know what they are going to, um, we don't know what they're going to do in the future, right? Because these, these risk assessments are not perfect. So I think it's a really exciting time in terms of what we're doing uh, with risk assessment. And I'm, I'm just bringing kind of us back to this four quadrant model um, as a reminder that we don't always know what people are going to do, right? And we're always balancing each of these four quadrants. And you're never going to, uh, you're never always going to be right, right? There's no, there's not a single time that I've looked at kind of a group of data and said, oh great, I've got all my, all my uh, people who committed violence and here are this, this true positive place and I've got all the people who didn't com commit violence in, these, in this true negative area, right? You always have some error and I think it's really important to, uh, to be cognizant of that when we think about our interventions. And I think one of the reasons that I wanted to talk about um, these risk-informed collaborative interventions is because one of the things that kind of this grand challenge has gotten me thinking about, too, is how can we use uh, perhaps risk or this collaborative intervention framework to think about what we're doing um, in terms of whole family systems? So can we use this in terms of what, are we, what we're doing in child welfare? Can we use this uh, framework of collaborative interventions or risk-informed collaborative interventions to pull together uh, players not only only from criminal justice and social service, but also um, from child welfare as well. And so I'm going to talk briefly about another intervention that I've been working on called My Plan. So this um, particular intervention, I think, also has some really great uh, promise and utility for, um, for, for use within, um, within child welfare as well. So My Plan is a, an app uh, that we created, and it's intended to um, help women identify um, whether or not they're in an abusive relationship, give them some information about their risk, um, provide uh, some information for them um, about their priorities or their values, help them look at their values in their relationship, and then provide some safety planning information. And so we have been, um, we've been working on this at first for, for about 10 years, actually. So we first developed it as an internet-based intervention, and I'll talk about the findings from that um, in, in a little bit. But you can still actually get my plan um, at on, on the internet. So you can do it as an internet-based intervention or as an app. Um, and uh, it's tailored for diverse situations. So the app version um, we had developed for college-age women. Um, it can be used um, for women with um, 
with female partners. Um, we can, uh, we have specific versions for uh, Spanish speakers, or if you're the, a friend or family member of someone and you're concerned about their relationship, you can also use my plan. Um, and so there are, there are several parts to my plan. The first um, is about um, relationship myths. So it kind of goes through some myths with regards to relationships. So um, some common domestic violence myths. For example, um, you know, if, if my partner is, is not hitting me, it's not that bad, right? So then we talk, to, we talk to them, talk to them. We give them some messages. We give people messages a little bit about emotional abuse and how that can be problematic as well. Um, we uh, provide some information about healthy relationships. So uh, we provide information about what should be uh, involved in a healthy relationship. What does that look like? Um, and then we do a section on red flags. So the red flag section provides some information about whether, if somebody's unsure if their relationship is unhealthy, it can give them some information about uh, whether, based on their answers, their relationship seems to be unhealthy or not. We follow that with a risk assessment. So I like to talk about risk assessment as having a couple of important, um, a couple of important parts. But one of the important things about risk assessment for me is that it can be an educational tool. So here we really try to use risk assessment to provide somebody some education or to provide the, the user some education about uh, their danger in their relationship. So a lot of people haven't thought about their danger or are unaware uh, that they might be at risk for homicide. So we give them kind of that educational information. And then we have them do a priority setting activity. And this is actually the decision aid portion of the intervention. And that helps them to clarify their values around their relationship. And then using all of that information, we create a tailored safety plan for the, the survivor. Um, so I'm just going to just show you quickly a little bit about these, um, these different sections. So this one is about the healthy relationships. So um, healthy relationships include mutual respect, safety, open and honest communication. So we do a little bit of education around that. Um, and then we can provide people information about whether their relationship seems to be healthy or unhealthy. Following that, we use the danger assessment, and we actually provide the user immediate feedback on their risk score. So uh, how much danger are they in, and how does that compare to other people in their particular who are in similar situations? The priority setting activity is uh, based on health research and is uh, used, um, so these kind of decision aids are used often for people who are trying to make uh, complicated health decisions. So uh, what we do is we kind of, we have five different uh, values or priorities that people uh, kind of pit against each other. So you can see here um, at the top, uh, you're looking at the difference between having resources and safety. So someone can say, safety is very important to me or having resources is very important to me, or they're about equally important. And once someone is done weighting all of their priorities, we give them immediate feedback on what they said their priorities were. Um, not surprisingly, uh, for women who have children, their children are always their top priority. And then finally, we provide a tailored safety plan. So using all of that information that someone has given us through the app, we provide a tailored safety plan um, that that person can use to, um, to come back to later, can use some immediate safety planning strategies, can use it, for example, to uh, seek out services in the community. Um, and it, it provides some, um, some information that they can use. And, they can, and people can choose which, which safety strategies are right for them. And we really like to be um, very clear that my plan is not a replacement for services, right? It's a, it's a, it's um, it's intended to uh, encourage people to use services um, and not to be a service within itself. And when we looked at um, the IRIS uh, outcome, so the original, um, the original study, we did a randomized control trial and looked to see, does this um, reduce, um, reduce violence? Does it increase help seeking? Um, and so we uh, published uh, the results of this in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine um, and found that the original uh, internet-based intervention did reduce decisional conflict. So when people had finished my plan, they felt more able to make a decision about what they were um, about what they were going to do in their relationship. 
It also increased their use of protective actions and it increased their use of helpful protection, protective actions. So people aren't just kind of shooting in the dark about, uh, oh, this might be helpful for me, I'll go, I'll go try that. But people actually said that the protective actions that they took were more helpful and people were more likely to leave their abusive partner after uh, participating in this intervention. Again, back to that question about uh, who are we intervening with and how is it helping, we did not see reductions of violence here. Um, so we did see that people felt like it was helpful, they were using more protective actions, they felt more clear about their decisions, but intervening with survivors doesn't necessarily reduce violence because they're not the ones that are committing violence. Um, and so uh, Rick and I were actually uh, talking last night and um, I think that, the, that this My Plan intervention could be a really good uh, place to kind of move into in child welfare. So many women who are victims of domestic violence are concerned about admitting that victimization to a child welfare worker for fear of what, uh, what might happen to them if they do so. Um, so this could be a really interesting kind of private confidential intervention that we could be doing for intimate partner violence in a child welfare setting. So I do think that there are some really interesting kind of overlaps and ways to think about uh, these interventions uh, concurrently. So um, I think uh, we've also kind of been thinking about too, uh, what are some of the things that could happen if the grand challenge is successful? So right kind of back to this bigger picture of um, what could we be doing to make sure that, the, that um, we're ending family violence in the next uh, 10 years, is that our, is that our aim? Um, so uh, I think one of the things is kind of this development of comprehensive family-centered and, and trauma-informed intervention so not only, um, I think we know that we can't just have kind of one intervention. One intervention is not going to work for everyone. So how do we kind of create an array of interventions that will work across settings and across families? Um, and I, I think the other thing that's really important about this is these interventions need to be adequately resourced, um, accessible, stigma-free. Um, so this idea about using my plan in child welfare might be a very good uh, complement to current child welfare services because uh, that, that survivor doesn't have to admit that they're a victim of intimate partner violence to their caseworker, but they can still get help for, for that problem. And then also um, we need to, and we were talking about this with the doctoral students earlier, um, but we need to have curricula that address intervention and prevention in social work programs um, across the, uh, right across the spectrum. So particularly uh, master students who are going to be going out and doing these difficult jobs. Um, what are the things that we can do to encourage uh, you know, family violence curricula across settings. And um, we have some examples clearly of innovative partnerships. So for example, Title IV-E at ASU were creating MSW and BSW certificates in domestic violence. Um, and we have an AmeriCorps program that's able to support uh, master's level students who are interested in um, doing their internships in domestic violence agencies. So I think that there are a lot of kind of innovative ways that we could think about doing this, but we need to, um, you know, we need to do that, find the time. And I think it's, it's really important as we think about what can happen if, if we're able to be successful is that if as we reduce violence, um, we're going to see a reduction in associated issues. So social isolation, homelessness, incarceration, trauma, and we'll also be seeing an increase in healthy and safe families. And kind of that, that kind of family space is the first space that we're all in, right? And so if we have healthy and safe families that are raising children in healthy and safe manners, um, that will... Uh, lead to more healthy and safe families. So I think it's a really um, important kind of thing to start thinking about in terms of how do we, how do we um, start intervening to create prevention long term. We are working on, um, a, there's a Grand Challenge book series published by NISW and Oxford University Press. And we are, I believe that there might be one book out already. Is that? It's coming out of school. 
Oh, there's a book coming out at SWIR, so everybody get prepared. Um, one of the book is co books is coming out at SWIR. We're talking about a book proposal on family violence um, for this uh, book series. Um, so, so that's an exciting thing that's coming up. Um, don't forget about our Stop Family Violence Special Interest Group at SWIR. Um, it is at 7 a.m. on January 12th, so everybody get prepared to wake up early. Um, that's going to be really exciting. Exciting. We'll all bring our coffee. It'll be nice. And then, of course, you can join the mailing list through the Grand Challenges as well. <laughs> and we have a bit of time for questions. And we have a mic coming around. She may just stop even if you don't have your hand up. <laughs> a few years ago, the, our newspaper ran a series on the Children's Crusade. It was a series of articles about children who had died who had previously been involved in our child welfare system. Um, frankly, I didn't think it was a very helpful series. It was really criticizing our public child welfare workers. And so, we had a blue ribbon commission. I agreed to chair that. I brought all the various people together. Sure, we found some things we could fix. But at the end of the day, I'm very nervous about anything close to promising we can end all child abuse fatalities. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure we can do it. I like to be optimistic. But I think it, given the tools and resources that our public system has, they cannot protect every child. Mm -hmm. Or what they would have to do to even come close would, would involve a level of intervention that none of us are comfortable with. So I just, I, I guess I just want to make the comment, I want to be careful that the grand challenge does not come close to saying, we social work researchers can figure out how to end all child abuse fatalities. I think we could, we could reduce them, we could think about how to make services more effective, but that, and, and so, and this newspaper uh, won an award for the series, which is a self-nominated award. So I know they wrote their own. So the award write it for them. So, so the award said, award to the plane dealer for this uh, campaign, which resulted in the child welfare director getting fired. Hmm. So, which was actually not exactly what happened. We had a change in government, and she wasn't rehired. But anyway, they took credit for firing the director. How is that helpful? How is that helpful to say, here's a couple cases where kids were involved in our system and they were later killed. And so the answer is fire the person at the top. I just, I think it's a dangerous road to go down. I think we need to be really careful about how we're going to promote family friendly services in an environment where we're trying to make these kind of promises. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's point well made. Um, we had a lot of discussion about how to name these grand challenges. Um, we had marketing and communications people telling us they had to be ambitious, crisp, brief. Um, well, I certainly recognize um, that um, we're not going to really stop uh, family violence in, in a decade. The idea is that we would make appreciable progress, that we would get people engaged, that we might um, take on some uh, targets that are manageable. So for example, in Maryland, um, if you have previously had termination of parental rights for one child and you have another child, child welfare, we match your parental rights termination record up against your um, record uh, that you had another child and we go out and visit you to see how you're doing. Um, we're trying to add if you have killed a child and you're on a birth certificate uh, that we would also go out and assess and see how you're doing. So there's some obvious targets that people should think very hard about why they wouldn't do that. Um, it's not to um, blame people who are using existing resources for um, being, you know, having some cases in the wrong quadrant, uh, as Jill so eloquently described, that's always going to happen. And I think the sensitivity specificity argument applies just as well to child welfare. On the other hand, 
The sensitivity and specificity are not fixed uh, numbers. Those can be improved. You can get more specificity without sacrificing on sensitivity through more precision. And that's really what we're aiming for. Well, I'm against family violence, just to be clear. I'm just, <laughs> I'm not, I'm against claiming we can prevent, prevent all child deaths. Um, and I just want to put a, a bug in your ear in terms of advocacy. I appreciate the shout out about our integrated data. I think we do learn a lot of things from the integrated data. And the project you mentioned, when we were trying to look at the overlap between homelessness, foster care, and domestic violence, we ran into a challenge with our domestic violence shelter that the rules on their data security are way above anybody. Else. So we have data agreements with most people in town. We get the data. It's upstairs. It's, it's all secure. And we can link it. But we couldn't get the domestic violence shelter data. So to do this study, we had to send social workers into the shelter and ask them to get consent from mom so we could look them up in our integrated data. It was very, very clumsy. So I just want to point out. I understand there are some constraints even in VAWA about yeah. yes. um, of access to data. I mean, I think that's an advocacy position, I would argue, for social scientists, that this was a case where something went terribly wrong. Data was leaked out, apparently. I mean, there may be many other origins, but one story I've heard, data were leaked out, apparently, to the police department, uh, and yet the charge against, um, a, the, you know, the, the perpetrator was a police officer, uh, and things went terribly wrong. So those are the kinds of things that you have one error, or you have a few of those errors that can um, really work against good public policy. We've seen that happen in child welfare. It happens in intimate partner violence as well. That, to me, is a place where social scientists should be advocating for, uh, you know, a revision of, of that standard. I think also in terms of kind of your uh, critique with um, ending ending fatal child abuse, I think also we need we need to recognize that uh, there there are things that are goals and there are ways that the, those goals are currently implemented. So um, the DCS supervisor was recently fired in Arizona, um, right? It hasn't it hasn't helped anything. But the way the way that these these goals are implemented, um, I think we need to kind of shift shift our resources and shift the ways that we think about about change um, because I think what I, what I hear you saying is that it's it's not just um, it's the way that we're doing these interventions or the ways that we think that we can change things are not always the, the way to do it. So if we had more resources, if we had adequately resourced social services, um, and these are all, right, when Rick was talking about ways that we've created change in the intimate partner violence movement, legislative advocacy was one of, one of those major things. And I think that um, kind of uh, making sure that we're, that as social workers, we're not just uh, doing kind of this frontline work, which which is so important, but that we're also trying to change policy and making sure that our uh, services are adequately resourced is, is just as important. Question in front. Hi, my name is Meredith Francis. I'm a doctoral candidate here. And I hear a recurring theme throughout all of your presentation, which is basically oh, we're focusing on the victims, the people mm -hmm. who are victims of the abuse or uh, violence, but we're missing the folks who are perpetrating. Mm -hmm. And how are, I'm sure this is part of your, your plan, but how is that work going to be going forward? Mm -hmm. Yes. I can start because I'm the one who brought that up. Um, but then but then I'm going to turn it over to Rick because I do think uh, Child Welfare Services does a, a better job of focusing on perpetrators um, than much uh, intimate partner violence research does. And I, I do think that it has been, um, and that this is why I bring it up, because I think that uh, particularly in uh, today's climate where we're seeing a lot of focus on perpetrators, we don't necessarily know what to do. So when we look at intimate partner violence, we have batterers intervention programs. You know, they work sometimes. Times. They don't work other times. Um, but that's, that's what we have. We have arrest and we have batterers intervention. And neither of those things are stopping violence. Um, and so when I think about uh, risk assessment, which is kind of one of my main areas, 
How do we differentiate people based on risk? How do we use uh, things that we know are risk factors uh, to turn them into intervention points? Um, what are the things that we can do to be creative about the ways that we're intervening in intimate partner violence um, and not just with with victims, which uh, most of my research, I will say, most of my research has focused on uh, what do we do with victims. That's kind of um, how I was trained. Um, it's uh, it's something that I'm kind of slowly trying to change in my own work. Um, but it, it's a slow process, and there's a lot to learn. And I think, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of like really great interventions for perpetrators. So I think that that's definitely something that's lacking and that we really need to focus on moving forward. So I think child welfare does have um, uh, some really good work, but even before I talk about that, I want to just talk about the VA. So the VA, as I said, has started to talk about people who use violence and people who experience violence, um, because they realize that um, the violence between uh, family members and soldiers' families often goes both ways, and um, they really need to look at that as a family dynamic. So that's really a breakthrough way of thinking about even using the language to describe what's happening in intimate partner violence. Now, maybe that change is only appropriate for the VA because of how it's comprised and the people who are in the VA are not a cross section of American society. Um, and and maybe, But they are trying to do more family-oriented interventions. I do think that that's been something that has been true in child welfare as well. Um, we're trying to do more to engage fathers. We're trying to... Um, uh, do more family therapy. Um, we have a National Center on Evidence-Based Practice in Child Welfare, and one of the basic things we're trying to talk to people about is, um, in this case, just working on children's mental health problems. If you have a child with conduct problems, there is no known evidence-based intervention that suggests that individual therapy is going to make a difference with conduct problems. Every single intervention that works involves working with the parents, the family members. So why are we playing UNO with kids who have conduct problems? It doesn't make any sense. Um, so we don't try to say it that way, although I would if I was the trainer. Um, but but it, the point is that there are a whole array of restorative justice practices that are being rolled out in child welfare and intimate partner violence. There's some work being done in the counseling field around family interventions uh, that can really benefit from this kind of screening that um, Jill has advanced, because if you know that your family is in the you know, bottom quartile in terms of lethality, then you may be more comfortable um, you know, referring them to family therapy than you would if they were in the top quartile. Um, but we don't do that. We have kind of created some rules that family therapy is not appropriate because the power dynamics are not equal, and you can't do family therapy if you don't have uh, people who can communicate at the same level of power. Well, there's some evidence to suggest that that is not the case, that power can also be adjusted through family interventions, but those are things we have to work through. Mm -hmm. So 90% of our world's data has been created in the last two years is a statistic that I keep hearing from my partner who is in um, the marketing industry. Um, Rick, you said that it's a huge opportunity for our field to be uh, focusing on interventions and that social workers are not doing this enough. And so I'm wondering, both of your thoughts um, are about using predictive modeling, using risk assessment, using text mining, um, and looking at this large amount of data that we have across these systems, and how can we use that for intervention or for prevention of family violence? So I'll take a quick crack at it. Um, I, I think there are enormous opportunities. Um, we know, for example, or we have the capacity to know, we don't have it all nailed down, but um, we have linked our child welfare and our juvenile services data, as you probably have. This goes back now, and, and our food stamps data goes back almost 20 years. Um, we know which kids um, have, in which families have ended up going deep into juvenile services and the criminal justice system. Um, you'd think we could develop a better child welfare informed intervention for those families, right? You'd think that we would do a little more instead of the usual 
open and close, open and close, open and close intervention, which we have in child welfare with an occasional placement. Um, so, I mean, I just think there are so many possibilities to look at longitudinal cross-system data to figure out which are the 10 or 15 percent of families that are just at the most obvious risk because they've already experienced these outcomes, because they've already had termination of parental rights, as the example I gave before, because they're already, their kids have already gone into juvenile justice or have died from homicides. Um, which are the families? Can we help them? I don't know. Um, but why wouldn't we start there? Um, I would hope that we could eventually do a much better job at, at finding those what Michael Wald calls 20% and maybe 10% of families that are just chronically involved with almost every one of the troubles that comes along with um, uh, being in, in, you know, a racist, disorganized, um, housing poor, um, lead filled environment. Um, and that interacts with their family dynamics to create these risks. Uh, it doesn't seem like that should be far away. Um, but we also, like you, house data from you know, nine different agencies, and we can only combine it with explicit permission, in our case, uh, for any two agencies to get together and put their data together. Mm -hmm. We have a long way to go and, and lots of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think um, uh, I think that child welfare is probably more advanced in terms of kind of having this this big data access than intimate partner violence services. I think in part because of uh, restrictions regarding VAWA and confidentiality. Um, but I, I think it's also and well we could say right oh I'm sorry I, I can't do that because of confidentiality. Um, we can also I think start to be more um, creative about the ways that we are thinking about intimate partner violence data. So um, we know that uh, survivors of intimate partner violence um, interact with many other systems. So for example, in the in the IRIS project, uh, the internet-based intervention, we didn't recruit women from, um, from traditional domestic violence services. We recruited them via Craigslist. Um, so this was like five years ago. I think people still use Craigslist. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but, uh, but we were shocked at the ease of recruitment that we had. Um, and people were, you know, we had, we had to take, you know, uh, a week out of our lives to answer the phone every time we uh, posted an ad. Um, and so I, I think that perhaps for intimate partner violence, we need to start thinking differently about where we get our data um, and that it's not always, we, we know that only a small portion of survivors use social services and a small portion of survivors call, call police departments. And so how can we start thinking about ways that we we can harness this broad amount of data. So I know, for example, um, Heather Storr at Tulane has been using uh, Twitter um, uh, and doing analysis of like the why I stayed, why I left phenomenon. Um, so I, I think that there are perhaps um, more, um, more creative ways that we can think about to use data and to look at risk and protection um, that don't involve only service involved folks. Thank you, that was really interesting. Um, just building on um, Mega's question, um, I want to throw out that um, there's another grand challenge which uh, has to do with harnessing technology for social good, and I happen to be involved with that one uh, pretty deeply. Thank goodness. Um, and um, so the, our grand challenge is really struggling with um, where this grand, grand challenge fits, because it's a, of a different caliber than the other problem-focused uh, grand challenges. Mm. But um, our hope is that by tapping into the other grand challenges, uh, needs for predictive analytics, um, other types of um, appreciation of how to use um, social media data, uh, and so on and so forth, that we can um, maybe collectively across grand challenges. Uh, think of investments that could be made to do things like free up uh, uh, data linkage that, you're, that you know, a lot of people are struggling with, um, raise capacity in the field to um, cross cut these different problem areas um, and see, you know, begin seeing those trends within the data. So just um, throwing that out is for any comments you have or optimism or pessimism you have about that agenda. I'm very enthusiastic. It's great. Um, <laughs> we had a, actually a very good conversation with the Center for Disease Control about this idea of using birth data 
for some actual public health benefit rather than creating the MRWS report every year that tells us how many kids got born for what race. But actually, they put most of the money into collecting that birth data. Local jurisdictions put some in as well. But they get almost nothing back in terms of public health benefit. And so they actually assigned a um, senior epidemiolo epidemiologist from CDC to come and work with us in Baltimore to try to figure out what we were learning from our birth match data. Um, unfortunately, uh, in the state, so we never finished the study despite all this high interest because in Maryland, our Department of Health treats birth data um, like it is the rarest, um, most um, uh, precious data on earth. There was a time when people were born before HIPAA. Um, I, I was born before HIPAA. Uh, my data, my birth data is public. I mean, really, it's not a disease to be born. Um, so how did the health department get this data in the first place? Uh, and how do we get it back from them? Because um, we really need that birth data. If we're going to organize individuals into families and into relationships, we need to get that birth data back. We need to work with the CDC. Um, we need to figure out how they can incentivize the states to say, we'll pay more of your of the cost of collecting your birth data if you'll actually use it for something um, or allow other investigators to use it. So that was one of our, one of our ideas at least. Well, we've, we've reached that time in today when we, we need to draw this to a close. I'm Cleve Gilmore, the Dean of the Mandel School. And it's my great pleasure to thank Dr. Barth and Dr. Messing for an extraordinary presentation on a very important grand challenge. And I appreciate the leadership that Dr. Barth has brought to all of the grand challenges uh, that have been formed, and Dr. Messing for her deep involvement in this one, and, and I know in, in, in others too, and for the leadership that our faculty members are showing, Claudia Colton and, and Betsy Tracy. The idea for having this series on the grand challenges was put together by Betsy Tracy and, and Claudia Colton, and, and Bessie was the architect for this, and so Bessie, we appreciate that. Uh, and you, you then handed it off gracefully to Jerry Mahoney, <laughs> and, and, here's, and here's what you are to do, Jerry, uh, for the rest of the year, uh, and, and uh, we, we have a, a great series. Today's presentation was, uh, I think, quite remarkable because it was, there was a lot here. And I'm glad that we do have this on video, and I think a number of us will be going back to look at it. Uh, when you were presenting, Rick, the, the charts of where the evidence is in there, I was thinking, wow, how many of our, grad, our graduate students are sitting there looking at those empty holes and thinking, okay, that's where, that's where I am going to focus it. And that's the purpose of a great analysis, I mean, pointing out not only what we know, but really what we don't know. And it's what we don't know that's going to be uh, very important. And then having the examples of the interventions that, that you've created and evaluated and, and knowing about some of the work that is being done here by people at our, our own Mandel School, in the, particularly in the Begun Center, uh, is very important in, in contributing to this. So this is a, a very strong uh, presentation this afternoon and I appreciate uh, everyone being here. And I'm glad we ended up on a, a uh, a note of optimism appropriate for us moving into a, a happy new year. So please join me in thanking Drs. Parth and Leslie.